Look at verse 8. Hold your place there. I'm trying to go through, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but trying to go through some of these uh, minor prophets. And uh, uh, I've been preaching just like, not going through them expositorily, but just preaching like one message from these different minor prophets. I took, I, I, I departed from it a couple of times, but I did Jonah and... Uh, Man, I can't even think now, but there's just been a few that as I'm reading through these, you know, in our in our regular Bible plan here a while back, we went through these. And so I read through, uh, I get a chance to read through them a couple times and prepare a message from them. And so it's been a blessing. But I stopped at Haggai and wanted to uh, preach on this subject, which is very popular. I've heard a lot of messages preached from this text and uh, particularly this verse, verse 8 says, uh, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified. And uh, that's the that's the verse that I'm going to build this uh, build this message off of. But actually, uh, I think what I've heard more preach, which heard more messages preached on, would be verse uh, verse three through six. It says, "Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying." Is it time? Um, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? And sealed, right there, just talks about being finished. You know, uh, you might think about putting up the woodwork and the decorations and the ceilings and the, you know, this is what's talking about sealed, sealed houses. And this house lie waste, talking about the uh, tabernacle there. He says, now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye are clothe, uh, ye clothe you, but they are not. Uh, the, there is none warm. And he that earneth wages earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. Okay, and then I read verse uh, seven and eight. So we see here that the people are saying, you know, it's it's not time to build the house of the Lord. You know, we got to take care of all these other things, and then we'll build the house of the Lord later. And God says, wait, wait, wait. So you don't think it's time to build the house of God, but you think it's time to live in the sealed houses and do all that and leave my house undone. Now, I have heard this preached many times that always had the uh, application made about, you know, taking care of the house of God and giving your tithes and offerings and making sure that the work is done and show up to work day and, and come and volunteer and do all these kinds of things. And there is a good application to be made about that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll share, some, share some things here in a minute because I do think these are important to, uh, to take note of. But realize what he's saying. This is kind of, this is kind of like a threat, okay? And this is why we got to be careful as pastors. Like, you know, we'll use this to just try to force, you know, just kind of bully people into, into doing something for the house of God, right? And it says that their crops aren't producing. It's kind of like God was saying like, hey, have you noticed that you keep, you know, planting and planting and planting and all, and, and you're not really producing that much, you know, what do you think stopping that from happening? And he says, you have your food, you eat, you have food and you have drink, but it's not making you full and you're still thirsty. You know, you're, it's not satisfying you. And he's like, what do you think that, you know, why do you think that's going on? I mean, God can take care of his people. Remember what he did with the children of uh, the Hebrew children as they're coming out of Egypt and it talks about how he fed them with manna. It says that their clothes lasted those 40 years in the wilderness. They didn't wear out because God somehow protected them from doing that. And he's, and you know, he promises to take care of his kids, his children. But he's saying, look, the reason that you're not being blessed, uh, you know, he talks about their clothing isn't keeping them warm. He talks about that their wages, you know, are like they're putting it in bags with holes in it. It's like their, their paycheck that they get. You know, they're just like doing the work and trying to get the paycheck. And, oh, man, I need to save this money aside so that I can use it uh, to, to fix my house and to do all these things. And he's like, it's like you're putting this money in these bags. And as you're putting the money in the bags and you're walking, it's just falling out of the bag behind you. <laughs> right. And God's using this and he's saying, look, I can take care of you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to build the house of God and put me first and I'll take care of all these other needs. And so, again, I've heard this used a lot of times in terms of, you know, hey, you got to make sure that you're giving your money and your tithes and your offerings. And I've heard this put as well. Don't, you know, give the house of God the second best, 
You know what I mean? Like you give her the broken furniture or the, like the food that, you know, it's generic brand and it's expired or whatever. You'd be like, hey, we'll just put that to the church. We'll keep the good stuff at home. And I've heard people make reference to this, like you're concerned about your own house and then the church of, of God gets second second best, you know. I think there's some application that can be made there. I think that's a, it's a legitimate message and I've heard it preached a lot of times and I don't think it's bad. Uh, I do believe, obviously, that we shouldn't give our second best to the church. I, I do believe that we should tithe. Not only that, I believe above the tithe, uh, I believe we should give offerings as the Lord allows us to, gives us opportunity. You know, I mean, there's not to say uh, that everybody has just uh, the ability to give a whole bunch of money to the church or whatever. But the Bible does have a lot of verses. A lot of times Malachi 3, 8 is quoted. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, where have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. All right, so the tithe is just like 10% of their the first fruits of their income. 10% of that. And then he says, not only that, but bring an offering as well. Now you can see why the world particularly scratches their head and says, well, these greedy preachers are just trying to you know, fleece the flock and they're trying to get all this money out of them. And, and I've heard people say, uh, you know, man, my grandma used to give, you know, 10% or 15% of her paycheck every week. You know, I've heard a lot of people say that like, oh, how ridiculous they made her give all the money. And I'm like, and you don't know. I know people that give a lot more than that percentage-wise of their income <laughs> to, to the church. But I do believe that it would be wrong to force people into, and you know, any preacher that's trying to constantly get more money out of the people, you kind of got to wonder, like, what's the motive? Like, are they, is it filthy lucre? I mean, why are they trying to do that? But it's something that I do hear uh, brought up a lot. Now, look at 2 Corinthians. We'll, we'll be back in Haggai, but look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Second Corinthians nine verse six. Insomuch that we desired Titus, uh, uh, let's read verse five first. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Uh, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion uh, of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Okay, and so he's talking in that, in that context there about... Uh, Man, I was reading chapter 8, wasn't I? Nobody stopped me. <clears throat> it's really uh, leading up to chapter 9. Okay, that's why it fit, <laughs> kind of. Look at verse 6 of chapter 9, okay? But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So, uh, you, know, you know, somebody might say, well, you know, I only give what I'm able to give, and look, I understand that. I would never ask anybody to hurt themselves financially or whatever. But there is this principle in the Bible that says, you know what, if you're giving, you know, about, uh, bountifully, uh, if you give, how did it say? I, mess, I messed that up. If you give, uh, uh, I forgot my verse, verse 6, uh, soweth sparingly, he shall reap sparingly. If he soweth bountifully, shall reap bountif also bountifully. Okay, so, so there's this idea that says God loveth a cheerful giver. So he doesn't want people to be like, oh, man, I got to pay my tithe again. He's like, man, just give because you love the Lord and you want to uh, help the work to go forward. So all of those, I think, are applicable. I do think we should tithe. I do think we should give our, you know, give the Lord our best, which would also include, you know, the place that we meet and all that. But here is the big key when it comes to applying this Old Testament prophecy to the house of God today. What is the house of God today? <clears throat> what is, uh, that's the word that was used, right? My house, right? Talking about the house of God. What is the house of God? Look at 1 Timothy 3. Start at verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. 
But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so he's like, the house of God is the church. Okay, now we often say, you know, kind of mistakenly, it's not, it's not all that bad, but we'll say like, hey, I'm going to the church. And I'm talking about the building. Like when I'm leaving the house and I'm going to work, I'll often say, hey, I'm going, I'm headed over to the church. And there's nobody there. I'm just going to be the only one at the, at the building, right? But I'll say church. Now, technically that's incorrect because the church is a congregation or an assembly of people. The Bible makes that very clear. I don't have to go in uh, and show you the verses and explain it any more than to say that's a, literally what a church means is, a, is an assembly or, or a gathering or a congregation. So when the Bible says forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, it's saying go to church, right? Uh, not to the building necessarily, but go to assemble together. Now, it's okay, it's right, and it's, and it's normal to meet at a specific location. Like, that's the place that we always meet. You know, whether it's a synagogue, or we don't use that word nowadays, but, but as it's a, a church building or a community center, right? we, like we used to meet at Matt Ross, or somebody's house. Sometimes there are churches that have to meet in somebody's house or the garage or something like that. But those places aren't the main thing. You know, now it's important, and I, and I think I'll get to this here in a little bit, why we would still, you know, labor to make those things nice and everything. But what's important is the assembly of people that meet in that building, okay? And so when he's talking about how thou behavest thyself in the, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, he's not just talking about how you behave whenever you come in. Because I, I remember hearing preachers talk about, well, you know, I don't know if they use this first necessarily, but they would say, when you come to the house of God, you know, don't let your children run around and, and you know, don't you dare drink uh, beverages in the house of God. And it's a sanctuary. It's a holy place and all that. I understand where that's coming from. You know, if someone has that feeling, I'm not going to say that they're like heretics or something like that. But let's be honest, the building is not the church, right? Now, should we you know, conduct ourselves in a, in a certain way whenever we're at the church building and we're having, we're having church time, assembly time, preaching, singing, all that kind of stuff. Of course, we need to be, things need to be done decently in order, the Bible says, okay? And it tells us a lot of rules. It says that the, woman, the women should be silent in the church. It says that, uh, you know, nobody sh people shouldn't speak at the same time, but one guy should get up to do the teaching, the preaching. And then uh, a lot of instructions about how things are conducted in the assembly, in the congregation, okay? <clears throat> so when uh, we're talking about building the house of God, and we're going to apply that to, to the church today, uh, you know, that takes on a little bit of a different, different meaning. So it is important to have a place to meet, and I would say that it is important even for it to be clean and to be functioning, you know, a, a good place where... Um, welcoming, maybe a visitor comes in or you bring a guest, uh, you know, just like your house building, you know, I've heard people say a messy house. That means because it's lived in and because we did, I understand what they're saying. Like it's your home, enjoy your house, but you don't want someone to pop in and be like, Oh man, I don't even know where to sit or all oh, that smells terrible in here or something like that. You want to be presentable, uh, whenever somebody comes and you want it to do your best. It represents your family, right? So same thing with your church family. You want the building to be a representation of, uh, of you, you know, you're clean, you're orderly, all these kind of things that would, that that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But keep in mind that the house of God is the assembly of believers and not the building. Okay. Uh, pr primarily. And so Let's go back and hit this application, you know, come up with this application from the book of Haggai. <clears throat> now, the points that I have here are, are just simply taken from verse 8. It says, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. We're just going to do uh, four points here. You can probably figure out what those are. Okay, number one. Go get the wood. Go get the wood. Now, I want you to notice this. Who's he talking to? Who's he saying, you know, go to the mountain and get the wood? Is he just talking about to the priests? You know, is he talking to the, 
the men in charge, you know, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel's like, not, he wasn't really a king, but he was like the man in charge. He was the leader to, of them to, to take them into the land. And, and is he talking to him? No. Here's what he says. Look at verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say... The time has not come. The time of the Lord's house. Uh, that, that, that the time of the Lord's house. I'm sorry. The time that the Lord's house shall be built. All it says right there is people, right? So who are we talking about? Look at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel. I already explained who he is. He's kind of the leader of them all. The son of Shealtiel, and Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God in the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent them and the people did fear before the Lord. So who is supposed to go get wood so that they can build a house? The whole remnant of people, all the people that he's talking, that anyone he can talk to who is listening and wants to serve God and wants to build the house, he says, go and get wood. Now, if the church is made up of people that are believers, right, wanting to assemble together, wanting to serve the Lord, what is the wood that's going to build that, that church, right? It's people. <laughs> Go out there and get people that is going to build up the congregation, right? Now, I remember as, uh, as a kid, I was always taught soul winning and the churches that we went to, fishers of men courses and stuff like that. I had an understanding about what our job was as Christians, go ye into all the world. But somewhere around Bible college, you know, here's what happens. Guys try to go in the ministry, they go to Bible college, they think they, they got it all figured out, or, or maybe they want to reject everything they've ever been taught and like think of it from a different angle or something like that. I remember I went through a phase where I wasn't using the words, the term soul winning because I thought that that was actually uh, incorrect usage of, uh, of Proverbs there and it's not really that's a misapplication of what soul winning was now i've changed on that okay in fact i'm working on an article for the website that says uh uh you know the a defense for the phrase soul winning because i believe it's a good term and we should use it but i went through this phase where i was like i just don't think i'll just call it evangelism or witnessing or or something like that which are all fine terms okay but i like soul winning and uh and uh and here's another thing i went through a phase where i said well Let's think about this. Should everybody actually go out there and knock doors? Because really when he gave the Great Commission, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, go ye, talking to his disciples, into all the world. Now look, it doesn't take long when you read the book of Acts till you find out the whole church was involved. And the commission was for the whole church to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's what they do. They scatter abroad, they go and they preach the gospel. But my thinking was, well, God's called some people into the ministry. This is their job, and they're trained to do this, and they know how to do it. And other people might mess up, and they might go to the door and say the wrong words. You'd be surprised. You're, you might be looking at me because well, this is a soul-winning church, and we all go out there. But you might be surprised to find out how many people have that mindset. Oh, I don't know about sending a whole bunch of people out soul-winning because they might mess things up and say the wrong words. Look, you can't say the wrong words. <laughs> the blind man... You know, as soon as he got back his sight, all he wanted to do is tell people, hey, I was blind and now I can see, right? The woman at the well, she wanted to go tell people, you know, I wouldn't stop anybody from going out. I don't care. Honestly, I don't care how they're dressed. I don't care, you know, uh, uh, what they're going to say, how they messed up. Now, look, there have been situations where somebody goes out and they're representing the church and, and I'm thinking, oh, this could be bad. But at the end of the day, I am not going to stop anybody from going out there and trying to reach somebody and preach the gospel to them. What's the worst thing they could do? You know, not get somebody saved who's already not saved? <laughs> you know what I mean? Let the Lord take care of that, right? At the end of the day. Now, obviously, we want to train people up and teach them the right way to do it. If possible, we want them to start being a, soul, a, a silent partner so that they can kind of learn off of the partner and they can, they can go through the process and find out how we do it, the why we do it. That's what this whole next week's about, okay? If you're interested, uh, that's, what, that's what the week's going to be about. <clears throat> but I went through that little phase where I was like, oh, I just don't know if, if, if everybody has that calling, you know, to go out and to act. Well, let me just tell you now, the whole church has got to go into the mountain and gather the wood. <laughs> okay, go get the wood. Look at Luke chapter 14. And notice that that didn't 
take away the responsibility of Zerub, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel or Joshua the priest, right? He was talking to them too, obviously. And they had a job to lead the people and to delegate and to instruct them and to help them out. But the whole congregation, the whole remnant was involved. Okay, Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 15. Make sure I get the right chapter this time. And when one of them that sat at me with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his lords these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the hedges, uh, I got ahead of myself, into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast come. Yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. For I say unto you that none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. And there uh, went great multitudes with them. He turned and said unto them, If any man come unto me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross... And come after me, cannot be my disciple. And then he uh, he goes on some great uh, pass, some great uh, uh, verses there in, in in Luke. Now, here's the thing: we all understand we're supposed to love our families. <laughs> we're supposed to love our parents and obey our parents. We're supposed to love our wives, hu uh, husbands, and uh, wives are supposed to love the husband. Husbands are supposed to love the wives. We're supposed to love our children. All those things, we understand that. But the point that he's making there is if you are going to be my disciple and follow me and want the rewards in heaven and want all that comes with that, right? you really want to please God and bless God, you have got to put God first to the point of, you know what, if it goes against my own family and you know, my own blood, you know, I love God and I hate my family. I hate love and hate, just opposites, okay? And so if you don't love, then you hate. There was not a whole lot of in-between in the Bible. All right, now, this is interesting because ultimately what you have is these guys making excuses, you know. Come to the feast. And they're like, well, you know what, I just bought these oxen. I got to go try them out. I just got this. That reminds me a lot of what Haggai's saying because... You know, here he's saying, build the house. And the guys are like, well, you know, it's not time to build the house yet. I got to build my own house and I got to go get the, you know, uh, the the sealed, uh, uh, you know, the material for sealing my house. And I don't even know if it's sealing your house. I don't understand how that word's used. But uh, to live in the sealed houses, they want everything fancy, everything nice. They want to have the, the cars and they want to have all this. Look, it's okay to have. Obviously, families, it's a blessing from God. Enjoy your family. It's okay to have a house and a car and to have some things. You know, enjoy those things. That's the fruit of your labor. That's okay. But the point that he's making is that you can't put all your priorities on the things of this earth and neglect the things of God. In fact, you need to put the things of God at the utmost importance, even at, at, if, it, if it has to do with neglecting your family. Now, what I mean by that is your family that doesn't, that's not involved in church with you, okay? Like maybe extended family or whatever who, who doesn't see eye to eye with you, that would be a different situation. Now, if your family comes to church with you, if your family goes soul winning with you, praise the Lord, your brothers and sisters in Christ are working together and, uh, and building the house together. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, uh, so he says, go get the wood. That's a, that's a command to, to all people. And I will say this, if we're going to build this assembly, build this congregation, right? I'm happy with the congregation we have. It doesn't have to be huge. But if our job, in order to please the Lord and to bring, uh, you know, uh, herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, right? If we're going to bring much fruit before the Father, we've got to go out there and gather up the wood so that we can build the house. Okay, so number two 
Not only do we need to go out there and get the wood, what's he say next in that verse? He says, he says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. Okay, so we go up the mountain and we got to get the wood and then we got to come back and bring the wood back to the house. Okay, now look, we go out and we find wood. I mean, we go out, we knock the doors and we find those people, man, that person gets saved. We would love for them to get baptized. We would love for them to start coming to the church and get discipled and all those kinds of things. And then we find out uh, many times that they don't come. All right. I just saw somebody posted on uh, a preacher posted on Facebook today. He said, uh, a, a child of God I'm probably misquoting this, but basically here's what he said. The child of God shouldn't be begged to go to church. Now, I agree with that statement. If you're saved, I think he said, if you're saved, nobody should have to beg you to go to church. It was something like that. I agree with that statement. If you're saved, you should just want to go to church. But the reality of the matter is not everybody wants to go to church. <laughs> I don't care how long you've been saved, how much you love the Lord. You maybe had a bad week. You maybe had a bad day. You know, you might have a lot of stuff to get done at home and you don't naturally want to go to church. And so it's real easy to get out of the habit and to not come yourself. All of us, right? They're, I'm not me. I pretty much have to be here. But it would be real easy to like find an excuse and be like, you know what? Not this time. I really want to and everything. I know it's no. Not only do we need to be here, but we need to try our best to bring some wood with us because we want to build the house of God. Now, what does that mean? Well, you got somebody saved, or maybe you're knocking doors and you find somebody and they're looking for a church home. Oh, man, I'm so bad about not keeping track of those, those people, right? We've got a book back there. And when you lead somebody to the Lord or you have a really good contact, the plan is write that name and write that information in that book. We'll send them a packet. We'll try to follow up on them. Look, we have not been doing a good job of follow up. And that's okay. Like our priority the whole purpose of this work is we want to knock every door in the Kansas City Metro, right? That's a lot of work to do. And so sometimes we're not going to go back and do the follow-up. And what we've found is a lot of times, Valerie and I went for a long time doing the follow-up. People are moved. You got maybe a wrong address. Uh, you know, it seems a lot of times like it's, it's not very profitable to do the follow-up. But you know what? We got to go find them. We got to remind them. Get their phone numbers. Give them a call. And here's the thing. You don't have to pass it off to somebody to follow up. If you let them to the Lord, see if you can get their phone number and then give them a text, you know, down the road and say, hey, would you like to come to church with me? You know, it's hard because we're always in a rush and we always, you know, barely make it to church in time ourselves and all that. But maybe the only way that person is going to get to church, if you say, hey, can I come pick you up? You know, uh, give them a ride. Uh, bring them to the house of God. OK, so we got to go get the wood and then we got to bring the wood. Now, sometimes the wood is infested with bugs. <laughs> the wood is rotting. The wood is, 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 is gnarly, right? It's not, it's not straight, <laughs> you know. Uh, we, get, we find wood. <laughs> we could make a good application here. We find wood that's not straight. It doesn't belong in the house. <laughs> okay. No, here's what I'm saying. Sometimes you, <laughs> sometimes you find wood that is infested or whatever, you know, look, I, 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 most of the time when we knock on doors, Hey, I'm here to invite you to church. But the reality of the matter is we don't necessarily want to just invite everybody to the, to the church. Now, friend day is coming up. I'm going to say, Hey, would you like to come to friend day? Hey, come be our guest. But once people come, sometimes it's real easy to tell like that person is not going to be a good fit, you know, for, for our church. And so it's real easy to be like, nope, we don't want that person. Nope, we don't want that person. We don't want that person. But you know what? There is a lot of wood that just kind of needs to be cleaned up a little bit. It needs to be straightened up, you know, uh, uh, and maybe it's warped, but there's ways to kind of like get it back into shape. And, uh, and there are some rough cases, right? That's kind of what church is about because we're all, we're all needing to be fixed and to be, uh, uh, you know, cleaned up and all that kind of stuff. And that's what we need to get into the house of God and get that wood to a place where it can help us as a congregation. It can help build the house of God. Uh, we don't want to just be selfish and say, hey, I'm only going to use 
the perfect wood that I have because you're not going to find it. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to build it and and uh, and do the best you can. Hey, remember that love, which is the bond of uh, charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Right, we're going to need a lot of mud and tape and paint. Okay, uh, but we're going to have to build the house. Okay, go get the wood, and then it says bring the wood. <clears throat> Not everybody, uh, what I'm trying to say is not everybody's on the same level of enthusiasm to come to church and wanting to read their Bible and wanting to grow. Now, you know, it's a blessing is whenever somebody comes and it feels like you're just, you know, am I getting through to this person? Are they getting it? And, and maybe they'll come for months, maybe even years. And then all of a sudden, one day something snaps and all of a sudden this person becomes just a soul winner and they love the Lord and they want to know what they can do next. Look, who knows how they're going to be shaped and how they're going to be brought to the place where they're a vessel that God is going to use. Okay. But we have got to understand that it might take calling some people repeatedly, you know, uh, admonishing them. It might, they might need to offer some rides. We might need to make some follow-up visits whenever we have the chance. And, and again, turn them in for follow-up. That's fine. Let us know. We can try to follow them up, but let's see the, 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 honestly, the most, most, uh, sure way to get them visited is if you, if they're your convert to go visit them yourself, that's probably the best and most effective way, uh, you can. Now, if, if you're not good on the follow-up, you don't want to do that. You think you're better at just soul winning and let somebody else do the follow-up. That's fine. Uh, have somebody else do it, but we've got to bring that wood to the house of God. It's easy for all of us to look at inconveniences and, uh, and say, you know, I have my own things to worry about. I can't do that. Uh, but, but here's the thing. The point of the message is we don't want to just live in our own sealed houses, caring about our own selves, you know, worried about those things, you know, the job that we work at you know, our, our, our family and friends and get togethers and all those kind of things. And those are, that's our, becomes our whole life. And it's like, you know, if I can squeeze out a little bit of time, I'll go to church. You know, if we have a, a really important service, then I'll invite somebody to come to church with me. No, this has to be our focus, building the house of God, right? And, I, and, and that's the next point, build the house, okay? So go get the wood, go bring the wood, and then build the house. Like I said, this isn't just the job for the pastor and the leaders of this church. You know, I praise the Lord that, uh, you know, I do have some guys that I can delegate and they can, you know, take leadership of certain things. I can call up on them and, uh, and they can head up the soul winning times. They can head up certain uh, things, functions that we have going on and all that. But you know what? It's not up to those people alone to do the building. <laughs> you know, it's not up to those people alone to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to be pleasing to the Lord. The Lord wants every one of us to, uh, to play a part. So I would say, you know, all of us need to learn what that job is that, that we have to do in the church. Now, look, I wish I was better at saying, hey, I need you to do this. Hey, will you step up and do this? Hey, how about that person? And the thing is, I was just, I'm not very good at that. I need to get better at that. But there are th so many things that can be done. Okay, uh, a lot of times we'll reuse people to do the same things just because it's easy. They just call on them to do it. As a pastor that has kids, a lot of times I'll call on my kids to do certain things because it's just easy to do it. All right, uh, but maybe if you're feeling like, I don't know why he never calls on me to do anything, look, I want you to be a part of building the, this, this house, okay? So here's what you do. You come to me and say, hey, you know, I... I would like to help in this area or that area, or do you have an area that you'd like me to help? Or how about, you know, uh, you know, maybe you want to sing a song. You have a special, you know, you want to be able to do something, you know, run that by me because we don't just let everybody just get up and do whatever they want. Uh, but we could use you in the service. We can use you. How about some in seemingly insignificant things, right? Like coming to, this isn't a promo, but coming to work day and, and being involved in that or cleaning up, you know, the uh, Zelensky's started volunteering to come clean, but they can't do it all the time. And every time we meet, yeah, he probably noticed we have food a lot of times whenever we, whenever we meet here in this church. And food, you know, leaves behind crumbs and people who track in dirt and all this. And so there's always vacuuming and there's always mopping and there's cleaning up and all that kind of stuff. Look, 
you know what the one of the biggest blessings is and maybe they don't get a lot of recognition and they don't get a lot of uh, uh, affirmation for doing it but one of the biggest blessings are those kinds of those people that just like look for those things that are being neglected and they say you know what I think I could do that and sometimes they ask you know if if they can do that and sometimes people I've noticed just take on ministries and they never even really nobody even knows about it they just kind of do it secretly because they want to be a blessing and uh, and I'm just saying look for things to do to help that now you're like oh, those are all building type things okay but isn't that all part of us meeting together things have to function things need to work smoothly things need to you know to work it's nice whenever it's warm in here in the whenever it's cold outside it's nice when it's cold in here when it's you see what i'm saying it's nice when things are clean it's nice when you can find a coffee cup <laughs> all these things need to be done that we just don't think about i don't think about them you know uh i and then every once in a while you're just like hey who was supposed to do that you know uh so you know yes i have a job to delegate and be a leader you let me do that that's my job but at the same time you need to be looking for what is the job that i could do to help build this uh this work and if you don't know but you want to do it talk to me you know because there's plenty of things to be done we're just noticing this last sunday uh even when it comes to passing the offering plate and counting the money after the service we're trying to find alternate ways to do that because it's like sometimes it's hard to go over there and count the money when you got to run up here and you got to do something else and so if there's just a handful of people doing it you know uh it's 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 real difficult but maybe you're you've noticed that that's the case and you're just like hey how can i be used you know in that in that area because we are all supposed to be part of not only going out there and getting the wood not only bringing the wood back to the house of god but also building the house of god it's a it's a joint effort we need people uh let's look at it this way so so let's Think about the literal building of that tavern, of the, of the temple. Not everybody was a master builder, carpenter. Not everybody was an artist and a craftsman, you know, that could do all the intricate designs or, or the paintings, all right? There was actually paintings uh, of palm trees and cherubims and, and pomegranates, right? I studied a lot about pomegranates this week. <laughs> and all these things, uh, you know, all these paintings and stuff that, was, that, that was, uh, are, are these skills that were used. But you know what? Some people, you might have thought that person nearly, does, you know, they don't have those major skills. Like the person that's sharpening the axes, <laughs> But look, that person that's swinging the axe, he sure is glad that somebody sharpened that for him, you know. Uh, when he's real thirsty, you know, he just sure is nice that somebody brings him some water, you know. When he's, uh, you know, when they're getting hungry and all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, we forgot to eat. What are we going to do? Who's going to make us food? Got you covered, right? Somebody took care of the food. Somebody, it's nice when everybody works together for the building of the temple in different ways and i realize again we're not building a physical temple but all those things apply we're going out there getting the wood soul winning whatever maybe you couldn't make it out that time but you can pray definitely you can pray you can call people you can uh, uh give contacts and say hey i know this person i know this would be a good place to go knock on some door you know there's so many ways you can get involved in building the house of god look at first corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, verse 12. Familiar passage of scripture here. It says, for as the body is one. Now, let me, before I read all this, I, so that nobody gets distracted because they're confused. Uh, when he's talking about the different ministries of the church, you have to understand in the early church here in Paul's day, before the Bible was completed, you know, there was a lot of miracles and like sign type uh, uh, gifts that people had that we don't have anymore. Okay. And I'm not gonna preach a whole message on that. Uh, but it's, it's done away with because we have the completion of the word. We have a more sure word of prophecy here. And so we don't need some of these, uh, uh, some of these things anymore. Okay. But the application here still applies. Uh, so what I say, starting verse 12 for as, as, uh, the body one and have many, all the members of that one body bring, uh, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have been all made to drink into one Spirit. 
For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am there, not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be hearing? Where would the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, into the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, but one body. And an eye cannot say unto the hand, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the foot, I have no need of you. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our, uh, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given un, uh, more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Now, I just got to think about this as I'm reading this. Like, you know, there's certain things that we need to take care of. Like, for instance, you need to take care of your feet. So, well, they're just little feet. They're insignificant. No, they got a lot of wear and tear. And if you have feet problems, you're going to limp. And if you limp, you're going to have knee problems. And if you have knee problems, you're going to have hip problems and all that kind of stuff. So we're like, hey, take care of your feet so you don't have that, that problem, you know. Uh, all these uh, things work together. That there should not be, verse 25, that there should not be, uh, so there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. When a soul winning team comes back and, uh, and somebody got saved, it's so tempting if you're the silent partner to be like, well, you know, I didn't do it. I was just a silent partner. No, you were part of winning that person to the Lord. So you go come back and you say, hey, we won somebody to the Lord. Oh, really? Well, what did you say? No, I didn't say anything, but I was still part of it, <laughs> right? Uh, you just go do the work. Do your part. You, you have an, in, uh, an integral part just by being a silent partner. <clears throat> One member be honored, uh, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Uh, boy, we could use a Spanish speaker tonight. We had like several doors that uh, we had an English, uh, I mean, a, a language barrier. And I'm like, ah, so mad at that. I, I still haven't learned Spanish. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I you unto you a more excellent way. Okay, we all need to be involved in building the house and to do our part, okay? And the final point is this. What does it say in Haggai? The last part says that he may, let's see if I mark my place here. Look at, uh, uh, look at the end, the, the, the last part of that verse, verse eight. It says, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. So the, in conclusion, this is basically what it comes down to. If we go out to get the wood, if we bring the wood back, if we're doing the best that we can to build the house, God says He will be pleased, and He will be glorified. You say, well, what if we go out and we do it, and we're trying to build this church, build this house of God. And, you know, a couple years from now, we've given it our best, but we still don't have lots of people here. God's still pleased because we went out to get the wood. We worked at bringing the wood back. We tried to build the house. The house is what it is. God knows how big the house needs to be. God knows what the house is supposed to look like, but he's going to be pleased with the end result because we're doing what he asked us to do. And really the Bible, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we're just doing the best that we can, but ultimately we're leaving it up to Him, okay? Uh, what, if, uh, what if we do it, but we're still not prospering? I mean, we're still 
uh, still seems like the funds aren't there. We're just barely getting by. Like, you know, you still have uh, Pastor Randall still coming and traveling. When are we going to get a pastor, you know, that stays put and he's here all the time or whatever? Look, just go do the work. Let God build the church. You know, let God be pleased in our efforts and what we've done. Okay? Uh, we have to continue to trust Him and to continue to do our best to please Him and not make this about other people in the church and what they're doing or what they're lacking. Not make this about Zerubbabel, not to make this about the priest, not to make this about anybody, but just do your part in building the house. And that's what God's going to be pleased with. He's going to be pleased with you because you did all you could to, uh, to bear Him much fruit, which is what we're ultimately doing when we try to build the house of God. So what did Jesus say? He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, was that the only commission, the only part of the commission? No. After they received the gospel, we're supposed to get them baptized, right? It's kind of like a, kind of like a sealing of the deal. I'm not saying they're not saved if they don't get baptized, obviously, but hey, that's like the next step. That's the first step of obedience, right? Is the way we say it. They, they, they've been saved and now they're making a public profession. They're saying, hey, I want to be part of this church. I want to, you know, be involved in the work of the Lord. And then what we do, the next step is teach them all things, right? And we, and we get them in a church. We get them reading their Bible. We get them some materials and, and, uh, and they sit under the preaching week after week after week. Look, every, week, every time you sit under the preaching, you're only getting, I mean, I'm giving you a whole lot, but you're only getting about that much in your brain, okay? But after about a hundred sermons, you know, you might have that much. <laughs> it's still growing. So keep coming and keep coming and keep bringing people and, uh, and keep spreading, that, uh, spreading the word. Praise the Lord for people that love the Lord. They want to read their Bible. They want to grow. They want to... Uh, be holy and do with their lives what God would have them to do. They want to go out soul winning and build the house. I just pray that we will continue to do that and to uh, to go get the wood. Let's pray. Father, we pray for your uh, blessings on this work. I pray for the week uh, here coming up. Uh, I pray this uh, Sunday, uh, Brother Nelson, that you would give him uh, good messages to preach and, and that he'd be a blessing to our people. And, uh, and then I pray, Lord, that, that the whole week, Lord, of all the soul winning times and all the lesson times that would be a blessing and be a help to our church to help us to go out and do what you've called us to do and to be reminded and refreshed about why we do what we do and the importance of it. And I pray you be honored and glorified with all that we do in faith and in efforts of bearing much fruit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.